Hello, my name is Vinay Badwar. I'm honored to be accompanied by four distinguished guests to discuss this roundtable discussion here at the STS annual meeting in Los Angeles to cover the topics of mitral valve repair. I'm accompanied by Dr. Joseph Lamellis, Dr. Randy Chitwood, Dr. David Adams, and Dr. Aubrey Galloway. Yes, hi, I'm Dr. Joseph Lamellis. I'm the Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Mount Sinai in Miami Beach. I'm Dr. Randolph Chitwood. I'm a past president of the STS and uh, the director of the East Carolina Heart Institute in North Carolina. I'm Vinay Badwar. I'm Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Presbyterian Medical Center at the University of Pittsburgh in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm David Adams. I'm the Chief of Heart Surgery at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Aubrey Galloway. I'm Chair of Cardiothoracic Surgery at NYU Langone Medical Center in New York. So to begin this discussion, I'd like to cover some very important salient topics that are affecting our specialty of mitral valve repair, starting with handling functional mitral regurgitation. Dr. Moss, in this uh, session we just witnessed at the STS annual meeting, we just saw a paper from Bergamo, Italy, to discuss a multifaceted method of repairing uh, ischemic or functional mitral regurgitation. It involved using uh, three modalities of Gore-Tex cords, uh, papillary muscle sling, and ventricular plasty. What's your approach and what do you think about that approach and how do you handle this, this somewhat vexing group of patients? I, I think it's uh, multifactorial. If you just address the, the annulus, that's, uh, that, that may solve the problem, but I think the, the ventricle has a lot to do with the, with the mitral regurgitation. And, and classically in the past, uh, my approach was to undersize the, the anterior leaflet and mitral valve and in many cases that may solve the issue, but I think you need to address the ventricle. If the tethering height is over one centimeter and, and the LV is dilated more than six centimeters, six and a half centimeters, and, and also if the intrapapillary muscle distance is over two centimeters, my approach in the last year has been to uh, utilize uh, a ring which is exactly the same size as the anterior leaflet. In addition to that, a four millimeter Gore-Tex papillary muscle sling, uh, which brings the papillary muscles together. And uh, I think that that has, that has been effective in, in, the, in, in this past year solving this problem. That's been my approach. If uh, the, pay, the other option would be to just to replace the valve, which, uh, which obviously would not address the ventricle. Dr. Adams, what do you think about much replacement in this, this somewhat vexing problem? First of all, I don't think we have any data that that's a bad operation. So I think if you're, if you're not sure, and particularly if you're not experienced in some of the adjunct techniques for tethered leaflets, I don't think you should be concerned at all about doing a valve sparing replacement. Our own uh, techniques at Sinai still rely primarily on downside rigid ring, complete ring annuloplasty. If leaflets remain tethered or preoperative, we see very large ventricles. We also cut both secondary and targeted primary cords um, to try and release the leaflet and let it come back into the angular plane. So that's been our main techniques. And how do you decide based on imaging? on which operation to choose. Is there some specific pearls for that by TE? I think tethering angle is probably the most important, but I think that, you know, in my own experience, we, we tend to true size, we, we tend to use downsized rings that are automatically downsized. If the ventricle is quite large, we'll actually downsize either further. Otherwise, we will simply do the downsizing as the ring was designed to do. For very large ventricles or where you have tethering and particularly an abnormal saline test or ink test afterwards, those are the patients that we tend to cut. First secondary cords in the anterior leaflet, then primary cords in the posterior leaflet, and occasionally you just cut the cords, you have a curtain effect, that will release the leaflet, and sometimes you will replace the cords. We'll cut the marginal cords and replace it with cortex. Dr. Galloway, um, you know, Dr. Dion in, in Belgium has cut, commented about cutting cords and, and going to jail. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that, and how do you approach it in, at NYU? Well, I believe the data uh, are pretty strong when the ventricle is not extremely spherical and not extremely enlarged uh, and there is not a tremendous amount of tethering, and I'll define that more, that you can repair these valves with rigid annual plastic that you under, undersize. And I think that accounts for probably an excess of 90% of the ischemic mitral insufficiency that most surgeons see. 
we look at left ventricular end diastolic diameter as per Dr. Dion's paper. If it's more than 6.5 centimeters and the tethering length or the coaptation depth is more than one centimeter, become concerned in that group of patients that an undersized annual plasty uh, alone will, will result in definitive long-term correction of the mitral insufficiency. So in our own practice, we would, we would most likely attempt to cut secondary cord in the anterior leaflet and plicate the posterior papillary muscle up to try to raise this higher. But I would again have no argument with people replacing uh, those valves uh, if they're not comfortable with the, the, those techniques, using a cordal sparing replacement because you don't want to be wrong in that patient. You don't want to repair the valve and then come off bypass and then find out that when the heart stretches back out, it's going to be insufficient. So I, I would be cautious unless you do a lot of valve repairs to, in that group of doing these adjunct techniques. We, I do a lot of valve repairs, but if you don't do a lot of valve repairs, then you may be concerned about that. Uh, and briefly, um, Dr. Adams uses a circumferential rigid ring. Do you use the same or do you have another option? <clears throat> well, we use a, we believe you need a rigid ring that remodels the annulus. We actually <coughs> use an incomplete rigid ring that fixes to the trigons, and, and our results have been comparable with that versus whether we used a complete ring. But I think rigidity is important That's because important. you need annular remodeling. Dr. Chitwood, um, are these patients uh, not candidates for robotic repair? Or um, do you sometimes approach these functional patients that are not going to obviously require coronary bypass, but um, functional definitely etiology? What, what's your well, approach? we approach most of these patients using minimal invasive techniques. Uh, even with very low ejection fractions, we may use ventricular fibrillation to protect the heart, cold ventricular fibrillation. And I think we do the same repair type. Uh, most of the time we put a ring in. But I will tell you, with this, as per the NIH study that's ongoing now, you know, we really don't know what's better. And so in these very dilated ventricles, you got one shot, especially the patients who've had coronary artery bypass surgery, and now you're going in to relieve symptoms because there's really no data that, that I know of that says that you're going to really preserve longevity by doing this. So I don't think there's any question to replace the valve with cordal sparing. Uh, but when we put a ring in, we'll often, it's a rigid ring, uh, downsized a little bit, cut anterior leaflet cords. I haven't used the, the, the crone technique or the, sw the sling posteriorly, but everybody needs to remember it. this is a ventricular problem. This is not a valvular problem, and that, val that ventricle can continue to remodel. So with any kind of repair, there is a possibility long-term that you could have re residual in uh, recurrent uh, insufficiency. So to summarize, we've heard from four experts in the field that um, commenting on a still a vexing global problem of if you're comfortable repair, repair with a rigid uh, annuloplasty. If you're very comfortable with repair, you can navigate alternate techniques and minimally invasive approaches. Otherwise, it's still acceptable, uh, perhaps until we have more data, that replacement isn't a viable option. Um, so that's excellent. Uh, now, why don't, why don't we move on to another topic uh, that we had seen in our session just now on uh, several papers on low ejection fraction and approaching mitral valve surgery. Um, there was a, a paper to talk about minimal invasive therapy and low ejection fraction, uh, noting that um, outcomes were acceptable. Um, Dr. Lomelis, is there a cutoff that you utilize on how low can you go uh, before choosing minimally invasive versus non-minimally invasive techniques? And, and define what that is for you. Well, in my practice, all of my uh, isolated mitrals or double valves uh, are performed via minimal invasive approach. In addition, even the, the ischemic patients that, that, uh, that can undergo a hybrid type procedure, we will perform an angioplasty of one or two vessels and, and proceed in a minimal invasive fashion. In, in my experience, I feel that, that, that these patients with low ejection fractions, even lower than 25 percent, benefit from this approach. I think there's something to say for leaving the heart in its own domain of uh, avoiding uh, the, the, the manipulation of the heart, the subsequent edema that, that occurs. I think these patients tolerate pulmonary hypertension more because the, the, uh, the heart is, is contained within the pericardium and, and they respond hemodynamically better being weaned from cardiopulmonary bypass. And, and in my practice, I, all, all the patients are approached through this uh, minimal invasive or lesser invasive axis. Do you have a cutoff, Dr. Chitwood? 
Not really. I, I basically operate on a low, lot of low ejection fraction patients. I think one thing that's important is low ejection fraction with atrial fibrillation is different than low ejection fraction without atrial fibrillation because if you can correct the atrial fibrillation in these low ejection fraction patients they do a whole lot better and you'll find patients will increase their ejection fraction many, many of the time. But in those very low ejection fractions, you know, below 20, then I usually cool them down, fibrillate uh, using a, a pacing wire or a pacing swan uh, and, uh, and and operate on them. And, you know, you go back to Blaise Carabello's stuff that probably they're not going to get worse. But I'm perfusing the heart the whole time. Mm. Dr. Adams, continuous variable is an ejection fraction. This is not a fixed point of 40 percent, 35 percent. And we all know that, that uh, patients that have been waiting for a long time and they come very late, um, they're dilated, their LVEDD is enlarged. Uh, t tell us your opinion on the timing of when repair should be done. And we all expect that the ejective fractures can go down a little bit. Explain why and, and, and the gradation of how you choose um, how low the ejective fraction could go before repair. Well, I give you three quick points. One is from Rakesh Suri's uh, paper at Mayo recently looking at your pre-op ejection fraction versus what your ejection fraction and afterwards. And if you want your post-op ejection fraction to be 60 or greater, actually in that series you need to have your surgery when your pre-op ejection fraction was greater than 65. So 60 is a cutoff for survival. That was not looking, the original Mayo data that impacted the guidelines was not looking at eject post-op ejection fraction. I think that's a really important point that we need to, we're, you're going to see the guidelines, I think, creep up as surgery gets more dependable. I think perhaps most importantly is, and the second point I'll make is that ejection fractions fall after mitral surgery. Again, Mayo has published papers with, with Serrano and, and the surgical group showing us that the average drop is about 8%. There's a variation of about 8% or 10%, so that shouldn't surprise us. I think the most important data that's come out recently that I've seen is from uh, Trabui in this mitral research group looking at near trigger points. So it's not it's not just that it's not a, it's a continuous variable, but there are also other things. So for example, they looked and if your systolic dimension was 37 or greater, not 40, the trigger point, and if your ejection fraction was 65, 64 are greater. Those patients actually, if you looked at those two groups, the combination of 37 and 64 predicted 50% of those patients had reduced ejection fraction after surgery, less than 50%. So I think what you're going to see in the future guidelines is more research like that that's going to lead to a combination of near trigger points. It's not just one number. I'm sure that the small ventricle with a lower ejection fraction does better, may, may do just as well as a patient that has still a normal ejection fraction if you define it above 60, but now the, vent, the diastolic systolic dimension is 39. So 30, 38 plus 62 may not be safe to keep following patients, and I think we'll see some more of that echo literature coming out. Dr. Galloway, in, in your practice, when you have an ejection fraction of 30 percent, uh, measured by all the appropriate criteria. Do you still approach those minimally invasive? And, and what are your myocardial, myocardial protection strategies or pearls that uh, help you through the case? Well, actually, in our practice, we do. Uh, but we have a large experience uh, with the minimally invasive approach in, in other patients, and we continue to approach it this way because we haven't seen prolonged cross clamp times or perfusion runs compared to open surgery, and we use blood cardioplegia, um, anti-grade and retrograde multi-dose, and most of those patients you're putting an anoplasty uh, ring in, and that can be readily done. In experienced hands, minimally invasive. For the, for the audience of cardiac surgeons as a whole, or I would say the, the key point is to just do the good, efficient operation and protect the heart because that's really what we're, we're after. Uh, so uh, if, if you don't specialize in a certain approach, then you should do the approach of valve repair that's most reproducible, that keeps you on the heart-lung machine the, length, the least amount of time, give good myocardial protection, because we're talking about prolonging that patient's life and you can't, don't have any margins uh, of 
of era. And that brings up our, our final question of this roundtable, um, which is a very excellent comments is, you know, our specialty is becoming more and more interested in, in expanding from non-valvular to valvular surgery and even more so interested in much of valve repair techniques. What can we do as a specialty to raise the bar to have all of us uh, achieve the 90% repair rates that, that all five of us enjoy? Um, can you give us some specific pearls, uh, maybe Dr. Adams, you can start on helping the surgeon that's just beginning their practice in much valve repair on how to how to achieve those those laudable rates. Yeah. I think the key is comes back to to understanding lesions and complexity of disease. And I think the most important thing that we can tell a young surgeon that wants to develop a good practice in mitral valve repair is to get good results. Particularly as you're sort of proving yourself. And the way to do that is whether you when you see more complex lesions, for instance, by leaf foot prolapse or mitral annular calcification, or you're operating on a young rheumatic patient, patients where you're going to need more experience and skill to, to dependably repair those valves, get your senior partners involved, find your local hospital or regional area that does those operations, and really be, be careful. That, that's if I'm convinced that if we just recognize that 20% of patients is responsible for 70% of replacement, that those are the patients that need to have special attention in, in, within, either within your own hospital from experts or in the region from people that are really focused on this. I think this is the most important thing because I, I don't think the answer is send everybody to a reference center. The answer is very targeted patients that you need to, to either refer, you know, get another person to help you do them or send them somewhere that does a lot of them. Not every patient does some of them. Excellent. Dr. Chitwood, uh, you've, you've uh, been very instrumental in STS position papers on transitioning to robotic surgery and minimally invasive surgery. Uh, could you highlight for us uh, some of the lessons on how a surgeon who has begun their practice on mitral valve surgery that wants to embark on minimally invasive or even robotic, what's the pathway to, to follow and, and why and, uh, to can help us guide safety? Well, it's very, a very clear pathway. And first off, you've got to be able to repair a mitral valve. And that's the question. If you can't repair a mitral valve, learn to do it through a sternotomy and standard techniques, whether it's in your training or some postgraduate work, or go visit experts and learn how to do this. And I think the way to get more people to repair valves is to first, the assessment is key, to really understand what's wrong with the valve from 3D echo and from the visual assessment. And also to learn simplification techniques that, you know, we thought we had to take big quadrangular resections and do big sliding plasties. There are some operations that you can do for the posterior component especially that are simplification techniques. Now once you are comfortable in repairing mitral valves, and I would say at least 50 cases under your belt on the posterior leaflet, then you can move to minimally invasive. Not a robotics, but minimally invasive. It's a stepwise thing, whether it's minimally invasive through a small hemisternotomy or through a thoracotomy, which is a little bit larger using direct vision, maybe aided a little bit by endoscopic vision, then you learn the perfusion platforms, you learn the protection platforms, and then you're probably ready to at least embark on the robotic component. There's nothing robotic about it. This is just a very expensive pair of scissors, a very expensive pair of forceps, and basically uh, with excellent three-dimensional visualization. So there's nothing magic about the robot. In fact, the complexity of the robot is the team. It's assembling the team to make it all happen happen. And, uh, and so I think that's, that's at the top of ever summit is robotics. We, through our training programs, can cut out a lot of the learning curve and a lot of the intermediate things. You got to be able to repair a mitral valve and you got to understand the principles first. So picking the cases carefully, identifying pathology, pathology directed learning, and once you've embarked on uh, fair comfort of mitral valve repair, then progress towards minimally invasive and then eventually robotic. Exactly. After, after a minimum of 50 cases is your... Well, I think, you know, I think you've got to do, you got to be able to repair a valve, mm -hmm. and then I think you need, you know, 50 or 60 cases minimally invasively. And I, I, I tell folks, go watch others do this. 
people like the individuals at this table. Go watch them repair valves, minimally invasively and maximally invasively. You know, understand how to repair from the experts. They can give you tips. Exactly, and um, through our quality metrics in the SDS database, uh, very soon mitral valve repair may become a quality metric. So we want to do good valve repair first. Joe, Granny, David, Aubrey, thank you very much. And this concludes our session on, at the STS Annual Meeting in Los Angeles, uh, a very informative discussion on mitral valve repair.